Okay, it's six o'clock now, so we would like to start. Um, right, thank you. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar is Art and Culture um, of Bonsai. We see a lot of people are interested in from the registration. We're so excited with this opportunity to learn a lot of bonsai. We are offering this presentation with the general support from Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. Today's presenter, Mr. Evan Luce, has a 45 years of experience in the cardiac cath lab. He helped with the first angioplasty in Cincinnati and taught many physicians and hospital staff um, how to perform uh, coronary stent procedures upon FDA's approval in 1993. Mr. Luce is currently the clinical CTO, chronic total occlusion coordinator specialist for the cardiac uh, cath lab at the Christ Hospital, Cincinnati, Ohio. So besides his professional work, he has studied the art of bonsai since 1991. He has studied with many national and international bonsai masters. He has attended lectures and workshops at regional and national bonsai conferences. In the fast paced environment and stressful world today, he said bonsai is one of the best mental health hobbies and one must have a future vision for bonsai, a living work of art. He's a cardiac specialist. I think we should take this word seriously. Um, his dream, uh, he dreams of visiting uh, Japan someday soon. So as usual, when you have questions, please use the Q&A box. He doesn't mind to be interrupted. So we'll take uh, questions um, when you, you let us know as much as possible. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Luce. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. And it's all yours. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be asked to join you this evening. And as said, I'm Evan Luce. I'm the current first vice president and program chairman of the Bones Society of Greater Cincinnati. I'm also the past president. I've hold, held all the offices of the Bones Society of Greater Cincinnati. I'm current vice president of the Mid-America Bones Alliance. And as previously stated, I have studied the art of bonsai for quite some time. Bonsai is literally means tree in a shallow tray. And it can be hundreds of years old, or they can be made to look hundreds of years old, but they are really are not. The trick is to make them have the illusion of age. Bonsai are many species. You can have bonsai that are pines, junipers, tropical trees such as ficus, deciduous trees, which are ones that lose their leaves in winter. A bonsai such as deciduous trees, you leave outside all year round and they lose their leaves just like a tree in the ground would. They turn colors. They're fall colors, just like a tree in the ground would. And it's really cool to see them change the, these seasonal changes with a little tree in a pot. Also, you can have flowering bonsai, such as azaleas. Here's some examples of pine bonsai. Uh, the one on the left is a white pine, and the one on the right is a black pine. You can have juniper bonsai. These are shimpaku junipers. You can have tropical bonsai. These are two of mine that I have that are tropical. These are called narrow leaf ficus. Tropical bonsai must be brought in during the winter time when the temperature gets below 
oh, 45 degrees outside, you should bring them in and place them under grow lights because they cannot take the winter temperatures. They are not cold hardy, such as your pines and junipers and deciduous trees would be. Here's an example of some deciduous trees. You can see they're in their fall color and they will actually lose their leaves. So you would leave the deciduous trees out year, 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 out year round and they have to go through the cold temperatures and the seasons just like a tree in the ground would. And they will eventually become bare and lose all their leaves. And then when it warms up in the spring, they will go ahead and put out new leaf and new growth. You can have flowering and fruiting bonsai as well. Satsuki azalea is one of the most popular bonsais to have. And when you have fruiting bonsai, you can see you can reduce the tree and you re can reduce the size of the leaves, but the fruit you can never reduce. So you can have an apple bonsai and it looks nice and small and it's in, in the small pot, but the apples would be normal sized. So history of bonsai, Penjing was originally in China as early as the Han Dynasty around 206 to 220 AD and focuses mainly on landscapes. So in the Tang Dynasty, the oldest known example of Penjing is found. Now you can have different types of Penjing. There are Penjing for trees, Penjing landscapes, and water and land Penjing. So it focuses mainly on a landscape. Penjing focuses mainly on a landscape rather than with in Japan and America, the attention is fully on the tree. So this loses some of the attention on the tree, which is equally as important as the landscape that the tree might be presented in. And here's a mountainous type of penjing. The sand in between the mountains is, is representative of water. And you can see some little bonsai mounted on the side of the rock plantings. Here's another type that shows a little landscape and a waterscape and the sand is expressing water. So bonsai comes to Japan. Um, Japan gets most of the credit when we speak of bonsai. Uh, it was brought to Japan, it's thought to be around the sixth century when Buddhism was brought to Japan. So many of the Buddhist priests were bonsai and miniature potted plant enthusiasts. So by the 10th century, bonsai has been mentioned in Japanese history. So in the late, late 1800s, the overseas trade was set up and with more visitors in Japan, they actually would take a, a large fancy to bonsai. First decade of the 20th century, there's more demand for bonsai. So the techniques and styles improved and, and this marked the beginnings of modern bonsai. After World War II, the bonsai culture spread even more worldwide. So historically, bonsai has been passed on to the next generation by word of mouth and by observing master's work. Um, apprentices in Japan would study for years uh, with masters. So one of the early masters, Yuji Yoshimura, and one of his English pupils published the first comprehensive book on bonsai. It was thought that since the world was so excited and wanted to know more about bonsai, some of it was lost in translation by word of mouth. And they put a book that explained the difference of a container grown tree and, and bonsai. So they divided it into groups according to the shape of the trunk and the distribution of main branches. And it is from this work that the rules of bonsai emerged. So you can have the rules, but they're really nowadays thought to be guidelines. So when people study bonsai, 
you know, you, you do the, there's many different styles. There's European style, J Japanese style, there's kind of American style. So worldwide that you can really tell once you get very familiar with bonsai, the different types of styles from different countries. So Japanese went on to great lengths to refine the art. They have branch placements. You know, you have a first, second, third branch, front branch, back branch, side branch. They have different styles and such as a formal upright and an informal upright. A formal upright is when the apex is over the branch or over the base of the trunk. And then the informal upright could be like a slanted style where the apex of the tree is not over the base of the trunk in different sizes. So they also formulated the front and the back and the symmetry of the trees. And we also have wiring techniques and you have techniques for making bones I look older, which is like uh, a gin, J-I-N, which is where you actually break a branch and peel the bark off a branch to make it look like perhaps it had been struck by lightning and, and the branch and the bark is peeled away and you can actually peel the bark along the long axis of the trunk down towards the base of the trunk. This is called a shari, S-H-A-R-I. And these types of things are some of the techniques for making look bonsai older than they really are. So it's really an art of illusion sometimes as well. So you have lots of, about 10 different size classifications of bonsai. And some of the most popular sizes are the mame and the shohin types of trees. And as you, anybody that's been in bonsai a long time, the older you get, the smaller your trees get because you just cannot carry these big trees along any longer. So you, you'll actually find out that these big, nice, robust, majestic trees that you used to like as a young person, you can carry around. You'll find out that oh, I can't have these anymore because I just can't move them in and out. So your trees actually get smaller as you get older. So you can see here, there's many different types of styles of bonsai. You have formal upright, as you can see, the apex is over the base of the trunk. An informal upright, you can have curvature in the trunk and the apex may or may not be over the base of the trunk. And the roots around the base of the trunk are now called nabari, N-E-B-A-R-I. They're slanting, you can have tin trunk, twin trunks, multiple trunks. You can have forest and groves, a raft style. So that's where you lay a tree down on its side, cut all the branches off on one side, which would form roots underneath. And these are all originally side branches that you've trained upward and to form a canopy. Uh, broom style, semi-cascade is when the tip of the plant and the tip of the bones eye cascade over the side. And a full cascade is one where the tip of the plant, the apex of the plant actually grows below the base of the pot. Literati or bunjin, where you have a long tapering trunk with just a small amount of foliage at the top. Windswept. You can have root over rock, and that's a whole different type of styling where you have the roots over the rock and bury the roots, and then slowly over the next few years, expose the roots till the entire rock and root system is above the soil level. And you can have bonsai in rock, and this is a type of shari where you see the live vein of the tree is the brown, and the white part is called the shari, made to look old. You can go out and collect yamagori trees from the nature that you actually collect from the wild and then put in the pot. They have a lot of dead on their long axis of the trunk. And you can actually create the shari too by peeling off the bark to make it look older than it is. 
Now, what we do with the shari is paint it with lime sulfur. You can add little touches of India ink and the white paint to make it look grayish and, and the lime sulfur actually protects it from rotting. So all kinds of tips and tricks to make the trees look older than they actually are. Um, I have a question, Evan. Um, Absolutely. Uh, out of at least these photos, um, which one is your favorite? <laughs> That would be difficult. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. But I just figured since we have all these well, um, images. I would say would if easy. I had a real true formal upright, that's sometimes the hardest to do, even though it looks easiest because it's just straight because so many of the material you get are, 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 are so hard to get a true formal upright. So, yeah. Um, all right, cool. But then again, you know, a, a, a really nice grove or it can really look really cool. I mean, you know, you. There's so many different styles. And um, what, what you like to do is just figure out what you like best. Do you, do you want to stick with a you know, traditional strict Japanese method? A lot, a lot of the um, American styling now is making the trees look like they're out in nature mm, rather okay. than having trees where the branches are certain places. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually um, take time to wire all these indiv individual branches and put them in place and such. And so um, it, it, you can make it as hard as you want or as easy as, as you want. So my, my teacher always said, you know, make it as easy as you can, because if you make it hard, you're not going to do it. <laughs> an example of fertilization. That's good so, advice. <laughs> you know, I work in a hospital. I'm on call a lot. I don't have a lot of time to put with mine. So I do what I can when I can, you know. So that's that's a difference between ha having a lot a lot in your collection, having small and more immature bonsai. They take more work, and you have to wire them and unwire them and put more wire on them. Where you have more mature collection, that's when you just have to keep them in shape. So these refinements by Japan's bonsai masters made bonsai is what it is today. So as you can see, um, this is from John Naka's Bonsai Techniques book. This is thought to be the Bible for bonsai. And John Naka was one of the American masters. And he actually has a, a pavilion named after him at the uh, at National Arboretum in Washington, DC. If, if you're there, I highly recommend it. They have a John Naka pavilion and they have a Chinese pavilion. <coughs> Excuse me gorgeous trees. So you can see um, the apex and, and you can have, you know, you start from the bottom and you have first branch. It usually comes off the right or left. It's usually about a third of the way up. And then you can have a back branch and a left branch and a front branch. And it just kind of similarly goes all the way around up the tree and you should have nice taper. And the size of the tree should be six times the, the diameter. So there's always exceptions to rules, but when you, when you first start learning to style bones, I this is what you try to uh, emulate towards. You can also see that the first branch you kind of angled downward. So by wiring the branches, we actually angle the branches down. So if you, if you look at trees in the nature, um, young trees, the branches are reaching upward towards the sky, towards the sun. So older trees who've had the weight of the snow and ice and such things, they're weighted down. So the branches are kind of sloping downward from the trunk. So by doing so, when you style a bonsai tree, this gives them the illusion of age. So similarly, as you place the first branch, you want to try to have all the branches going up towards the apex, similar to that. And then when you get towards the top, you still want to have that. But with a younger tree, you will have branches that's still pointing towards the top, towards the sky. So, this is bottom picture is looking at the 
tree from the top. So not only do you want to have branches all the way around the circumference of the trunk. So when you're starting a tree, you don't want all the branches on one side and the, on the right side and the left side. You got to make sure you have back branches and you know left branches and some front branches and that type of thing. So as bonsai migrates west, we had, had universal exhibits in 1878, 1889, and 1900, which increased interest. And the for, first known formal bonsai exhibit was in London in 1909, you know, outside of Japan. In Japan, the prestigious Kokufu Ten bonsai exhibit is the largest and most prestigious of all bonsai shows worldwide, first held in 1934. It's sponsored by the Nihon Bonsai Association, and only the finest bonsai in Japan are displayed. So the Kokufu Show is a trophy, and it's awarded to the trees that's uh, best uh, displayed in the in this in the show it's gold colored with kanji characters which read kokufu prize now there the award is not given if they don't think it's a worthy tree once a tree does win the prize it is never again eligible for another kokufu show but it can still be entered additional times for display only and this is what the award looks like today So this is the first Kokufu Bonsai exhibition in 1934. All the bonsais are displayed in individual areas. And you can see they're all, the, the art of displaying a bonsai with a stand and an accent plant, or perhaps another bonsai is a whole art in itself too. You look at the pots, you know, you know there's, there's a whole art to choosing a pot for the tree. There's a whole art to arranging the shohin or mame bone side, the smaller ones on stands, and they have accents to each. That, that can be a whole nother talk in itself. So this is the Izu spruce that was displayed in the first Kokufu 10 exhibition in 1934. So it was well maintained. You can see that the apex was developed and additional branches were developed. And then it was again displayed in the 94th Kokufu Bonsai exhibition. So if you look closely, you can see the trunk is the same. The first prominent branch on the right is, is still there and they developed the whole additional canopy. It looks like a totally different tree. So 93 years later, that's what you can do with a bonsai. Bonsais can also be used in tokenomas. A tokenoma is a dedicated space in a reception room in which items are on display for artistic appreciation Often this includes a bonsai tree, a suiseki, which is a viewing stone, perhaps a squirrel and an accent plants, and the bonsai can be brought in and displayed for honored guests. Here you can see you have a clump style bonsai, a nice scroll and the suiseki off to the right. So there's lots of tools for bonsai. So you have wire cutters, which self-explanatory. You have different types of scissors, uh, you know, like the long handled scissors would be for getting into 
uh, deciduous bonsai to trim some of the leaves. With the deciduous bonsai, you want to try to defoliate the leaves. And by doing so, you actually reduce the size of the leaves. So the goal for bonsai is to try to make the leaves miniature as well. So by doing so, you defoliate that once, sometimes if you're lucky, twice in a year. You can have knob cutters and, and concave cutters. Those are concave cutting type of tools that you can cut branches with. So when you cut a concave branch uh, cutter, it actually makes a concave cut into the trunk. So when the bark rolls over to try to fill in that area, it will heal a lot cleaner and smoother. You also have leaf trimmers and bush brush and root rakes to comb out roots and root hooks to separate the roots as you're repotting your bonsai. You have aluminum wire. You have aluminum wire and copper wire. So you have aluminum wire, which is made to look like copper, but it's aluminum, so it's a lot easier to bend. It's not as stiff as copper wire. This is what a lot of people use in the United States. Um, a lot of times people use aluminum wire for deciduous trees because they grow a lot faster. So you may have to wire a couple of times a year. So as the branch grows, the, you may see the wire actually cutting into the branch. So you want to try to remove it before it does so to make ugly scars in a branch. You'd see like a spiral along the branch where the branch grows, but the wire does not expand when the branch does. So you see aluminum wire, when you uh, measure it, it has one millimeter to six millimeter, which is the per usually the sizes. So the one millimeter is a smaller diameter and the six millimeter is a larger diameter. Where you see with the copper wire, the copper is heat treated. So 22 gauge would be the smaller diameter and the 10 gauge would be the larger diameter. So the benefit of copper wire is you can use a smaller size because it's stronger. So we use this for a lot of pine trees and, and junipers. So the beauty of it, like I said, is you would use a smaller diameter and get the same strength as a larger diameter aluminum wire. But then again, once, it, once you use it, once you bend it, it's done, you have to cut it off. You can't unwire trees like you can with aluminum. You can unwire aluminum trees and use it again if you want to be thrifty with your wire usage. So when you wire, you want to start at the base of the branch and you hold the first wrap and then wrap it again and just follow that out to the end of the branch. And you usually wire a pair of branches at the same time. And you want to go from one branch and you want to have at least one or two curves around the trunk of the tree before you go to a second branch. So you try to pair, you try to wire a pair of branches at the same time and you try not to wire one branch directly from the opposite branch as you can see in, in this figure two or figure one here. Um, because if you were to wire it this way, when you brought this branch down, the other one would bend up, kind of like a teeter-totter thing. So there's all types of tips and tricks to wiring, and it is a real art form in itself. And you want to have them at equal spacing at 45 degree angles. And you can see that you start with the largest branches and then add additional smaller wire to the smaller branches and you try to wire all the branches that are sustainable enough to be able to support the wire. Now little twiggy type branches you would not wire because you would injure them as you have to wait till they kind of, the deciduous trees you would want to wait and let them harden off before you put wire in them, on them. And as you can see, you 
wire this all the way out to the tips and you want to try to fan it out and um, it's what you call good ramification. You want to try to have a lot of branches. So by wiring a tree and you can bring it down and give it the illusion of age. And on this one, you can see that they've cleaned up the live vein. And by doing so, sometimes you can put camellia oil on that to make it a nice clean brown look. These Shimpapa junipers have bark that will peel off and you want to try to get all the peeling bark off and then put this oil on it to make it darkish reddish. And then the shari, which is the dead portion of the trunk, that's what you would paint with the lime sulfur with some type of acrylic, you know, added India ink and perhaps some white paint to give it a grayish look. So by wiring this, you have a nice first styling of the bonsai. This is a shimpaku. You can see you've cleaned out some of the branches. And as John Naka said, used to say, you can have, you know, birds fly through the tree now. So it kind of opens up and gives it some branching clarification. This is a taxis and or U, Y-E-U, sometimes it's called. And you can see by cleaning up and trimming some of the branches, thinning it out, and you can place the branches, give them a downward slope, and you thin it out. And it, actually, you know, you, people think, well, you, you've taken the branches off. How, you know, how's, how's that going to help the tree? So if you have a heavy, heavy foliage on top, and you're actually helping the tree horticulturally by thinning out the upper branches so light can get through to the bottom branches. Otherwise, the bottom branches would become weak and you would see some die off on those branches. So that there, there's a reason that we do this. So these are a couple of American bonsai masters. Uh, John Naka is here on the right. And this is one of his students, which is my bonsai master, Richard Strauss. They were good friends. And one of John Naka's students was Ben Oakey who we have worked this many times. And here they are again. John Naka has a pavilion at the National Arboretum and his most famous tree is called Goshin, which uh, is protector of the spirit. So this is probably one of the most famous bones eye in the world that you'll ever see. As you enter the pavilion, you'll, you'll see this. So this is the National Bonsai and Penjing Museum. So I recommend you, if you ever go to DC, you can see Goshen there welcoming you as you enter. So the soothing sound of water greets you as you enter the courtyard. And these are one of the very special specimens here on display. Bonsai today, there are sold in nurseries and garden centers, department stores, they have kiosks at malls, you know, the home and garden show. This year there was a bonsai uh, booth. Uh, one of the gentlemen was selling juniper bonsais. There are also specialized bonsai nurseries. Those are rather hard to find. They're getting more popular now because there are more Americans going to Japan to do an apprenticeship with some of the masters and they'll come back and help pass on the knowledge. And for example, there's a person in Knoxville who has went and trained as a um, bones eye master and he has a nursery in Knoxville now. There's a couple nurseries in Indiana, in Indianapolis. So they're getting a little more readily available but a lot of times we'll just go to local garden centers and we might pick out a juniper or, or you know maybe a boxwood and we can use just nursery material to make a, a bonsai. 
So most of the younger um, cuttings, will, uh, you know, type of things you'll see at a nursery or maybe in stores are called pre-bonsai. And one thing that you should really consider is your location in the country. What types of trees are thriving in your area, whether that's uh, hornbeams or maples or, you know, that type of thing. You can have quite a lot of success with um, nurseries or material that's native to your areas. You can also get trees you can go collecting from the in, in the woods with permission of course and you know you can collect there uh, you know maples or hornbeams or you know anything you can start with seedlings and, and cuttings you can do air layers uh, where you uh, would peel back the bark and cover the area with sphagnum moss and then the area that is cut, they'll sprout roots, and then you can detach it from the bottom of the tree. So that, that's a whole nother way to propagate bonsai. But uh, seedlings take a long time because, you know, it takes a long time for trees to mature. So if you're older in age, I would not suggest seedlings. As you can see, there's many places for sale. Bones Eye Online, you can order them. Brussels Bones Eye is the, probably the largest um, producer and, and, and uh, retailer for Bones Eye in the, in the country. It's that side of Olive Branch, Mississippi. You can go to local nurseries and pick out some really nice material for Bones Eye. You will, if, what you do with bonsai uh, material that you pick out at the nursery is eventually style them and then you would probably trim a portion of the roots and put them in a larger pot and in subsequent years you actually make the root ball reduce and eventually get them into the actual ideal bonsai pot. So my teacher always said it's better to have a live tree and too big a pot than trying to reduce that root ball initially to get into that. Got to get it into that perfect bonsai pot right away. You may end up with a tree that's in a pot that won't live very long because you've cut, cut off too many roots too fast at one time. And you can always do that eventually over the next few years. So this is an example of just some nursery material that we got that we um, then did an initial styling of a bonsai. So you would then reduce some of this root ball, <coughs> excuse me, and, and then put it in a pot. Subsequent years, you'd reduce it down to even further so you could get it into the perfect pot. So we wired some of the branches. These branches will develop and grow and then we'll eventually have a, a more finished bonsai in future years. So when you first initially style it, you want to look and the trunk usually dictates what kind of tree it is and, and the style that it will be. And you can see that we've just followed the line up and then we picked one of the branches to make a new leader or an apex. And we've had left branch, right branch, there's branches in back, a couple of these lower branches. We've ginned, J-I-N, where we've cut them off and taken off the bark to make them look older. So just by doing that, you've created some illusion of age. So to create bonsai, which is a living work of art, you must be patient. You have to have a vision for the future. So you'll get as much out of it as you put into it. So learn, read, increase your knowledge of bonsai, learn what works in your little microclimate, learn, learn your growing area. What, is it hot? Does it get a lot of sun? Does it get a lot of shade? So join a local club, get a mentor, trial and error. The Bonsai Society of Greater Cincinnati is a great resource for bonsai. 
We love to have people come in, whether they're members or not, you know, people come in. We have a meeting every third Thursday of the month at the Civic Garden Center in Cincinnati. And um, it's one of the oldest found, uh, one of the oldest bonsai clubs in Cincinnati founded in 1964. And our purpose is to foster and study the appreciate, appreciation of bonsai and bonsai related arts. So come, we have either local club members that are very experienced. We have national and international masters that come in and they will do a lecture and demonstration on our third Thursday. And then usually the following Saturday, we will have a workshop where we'll either provide trees or bring your own trees and, and you'll ask guidance from the visiting bonsai professional. So it's a really great resource. So bonsai trees combine a talent for horticultural design and artistic expression. Learn the needs of each species, such as light and nutrients, growth habits. There's, there's just all kinds of things you can do to make it as hard as you want or as easy as you want. So such as nutrients, you know, you can have, you can, people make their own fertilizer. Some people make their own soil by mixing, you know, maybe pumice and lava rock and maybe some, maybe akadama, that type of thing. There's all kinds of ways to buy, you know, to make soil. You can spend lots of time on doing that. I've always been taught, I'd rather spend time working on my trees. So I buy bonsai soil that's already made. I use fertilizer that's already made and, you know, pellets, I just, you know, organic that I put on top and as you water, they dissolve. And then I use an end hose sprayer like miracle, you know, miracle grow that I just water my trees with. And as you water it, you give it some um, nutrients and fertilization as well. So by doing it easy, it gets done repetitively and reliably. So I don't have the time to make my own soy. I don't have the time to make my own fertilizer, but some people love doing that. So be an artist, how will you design it? Is it going to be traditional, contemporary? Are you going to duplicate something in nature? You'll learn to see the potential in each tree. So from the philosophical element, what does a tree express? Is it a strong masculine pine or is it a feminine flower tree? What pot will complement the tree? So that, that's a whole nother art in itself you know, finding the perfect pot for that tree. So if you really get serious in the bonsai, you'll probably have 50 to 100 pots, you know, because you just got to have that one pot because someday you're going to want to use it and you wanna, you'll find a tree for that pot someday. So you'll develop an eye for styling. It, it takes a lot of time and you never stop learning when you do bonsai. So regardless of what style technique you choose, you'll develop an appreciation of nature. You'll learn you are creating a beautiful piece of living art. So there's a peace and relaxing atmosphere re surrounding bones eyes. So some days I'll go out and, you know, turn on my music. I, I just love the tradi traditional Japanese music and I'll turn that on and, and, and style my bones eye. And, and then there's, you know, there's nothing but no, no better, better mental health hobby than bones eye. And I need all the help I can get. So this is a, a picture of my yard where I used to live. And uh, I, you know, just create your own little sanctuary out back. And it's so relaxing. Wow, so, that's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great backyard. Uh, yeah, it's nice. And, 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 and I want to say this is in loving memory of my bonsai master, Richard Strauss. Questions? Cool. Yeah, we have, we have some actually. So, um, so... Yeah, happy to share my email or a telephone number if anybody has any questions or if they need any resources for the future. I'm um, happy to help you know we, we love sharing our knowledge of bonsai. Um, I did add the Cincinnati bonsai link in the chat if anyone is interested to 
Um, so one question we have is for beginners, what are the biggest mistakes to avoid when taking care of a bonsai tree? Um, probably the biggest one is uh, you'll buy a juniper from somebody that has a booth in a store and says that juniper can be kept indoors. Junipers are outdoor trees. They need to go in a cycle, uh, you know, in a winter cycle, seasonal cycle like like the tree in outside wood. I, I, I did that myself. I, I remember being on vacation in St. Augustine about this beautiful juniper and um, carried it through, running through the airports. I didn't want to check it or anything, brought it home, put it inside, and, and probably in about five months, it looked like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. <laughs> so the best tree to start for a beginner is some type of tropical tree, some type of ficus. Those are very easy to take care of. They're usually uh, disease resistant. Um, the, again, one of the biggest mistakes too is putting a bonsai tree in regular potting soil. They, they, they like, reg, they, you can do it, it's harder. Um, they like bonsai soil. Bonsai soil is coarse. It's more granular. It's more, more, more like small gravel. And, and, and it gets, you know, depending on the size of the trees you have would be larger pellets and stuff, but you can get pre-made bonsai soil and make it easy on yourself. And did you say a ficus tree is an easier one for beginners? Yeah, ficus tree is type, one of the easiest to begin with. There's so many different kinds of ficus trees. And um, there are ficus, you know, there's Green Island ficus, there's Benjam, Benjamina ficus, there's, there's, you can find them usually at Lowe's or Myers, Home Depot, uh, just bought one for my son at, at Costco. Oh, nice. Ficus okay, tree, Costco. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, is a, is a ficus tree a good um, starter for someone in Ohio too, where, where we are located? Yes, you just want, okay. you want to put it in the wintertime, put it in front of a bright window that gets some sun, or if you're lucky to have grow lights. And uh, once it gets warm above 50 degrees, you can take it outside, it loves full sun. When it gets wintertime below 45 degrees, you wanna bring it in and protect it. They're not cold hardy. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. There is another question. Oh, yeah. Do you fertilize a bonsai tree the same amount that you do a normal size tree? Well, I would say no, considering the fact my nor I never do anything to my normal size trees. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the tree in the ground is is on its own for, for me at my house at least. But I would say I, I fertilize my trees. I use an organic. Um, like a pellet type of mix. Um, maybe I put some of that on every month and I might water with uh, a mixture. I have an end host sprayer, like a miracle Grow sprayer. You put the grain and a miracle Grow mm -hmm. in it. I put fish emulsion and uh, fertilizer in it, mix it up real well and spray it over the foliage and the soil. So you get a combination of the miracle Grow and the fish emulsion, which adds nitrogen and greens it up very well. So it, it, your neighbors may not like you because the fish emulsion is very aromatic. Okay. <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, how does the styling of bonsai usually affect the health of the tree? Well, it actually helps it. Um, because if you have a lot of foliage up top and tree is a top dominant, you want to thin it out so air can get through it, so light can get through it. So if you have a lot of branches up top that's not allowing light to get through to the bottom branches, it'll make the bottom branches weaker and they'll eventually die. And as you display your bonsai outside, you want to rotate them on whatever stand or display uh, area you have. So you don't want the one side to always get light. You want to rotate that so you get light around 360. So like every couple of weeks, I might turn my bone side so they will have equally strong growth. All right. Um, another question kind of going with the uh, what type of tree you get 
Um, so the question is, what are the best evergreens for Northern Ohio um, where we would not have to bring the tree indoors? Yeah, I would say some type of juniper. You could do juniper. evergreens. I mean, you could get um, black pines do well, white pines do well. Um, Scott's pines are really fun to grow. I think that's one of the easiest ones for me. It's S-C-O-T-S, -S, Scott's pines. So that would be good. Boxwood really is an evergreen because they can, and they, they keep their green leaves the whole year round but they would want to be outside. I mean, you could do anything like, you could do like a holly tree. So there's so many types of what would be considered evergreen. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, another question, um, what can we learn from the art of bonsai that applies to other kinds of plants or trees in our garden? Well, Which I think I, I need that answer yeah, to. I would say <laughs> give them the appropriate attention and care. Um, you want to always check for disease or pests. You know, you can, the same with bonsai trees, you can get the same thing on trees, you know, plants in the ground. You want to look for pests. You want to look for disease, whether it's mold or fungus. You want to check for insects or rodents that are, 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 are having breakfast of your plants. You know, same thing can be with, you know, squirrels. So they love chewing on some of the bonsai branches sometimes. Um, fertilization is important um, with flowering plants. You want to sometimes, depending on the on the plant, you want to deadhead the the spent blooms, yeah. that type of thing. Um, which which kind of I mean not which uh, what where do you prefer to have your bonsai? Is it indoor or outdoor? I would say probably outdoors. Um, my area that I have for uh, my trees are out, out back in my patio. So in the winter in winter time, I have to bring my tropicals in and they're just under grow lights in a storage area in a basement. There's not really much opportunity to really enjoy them, but I have full spectrum grow lights downstairs. Oh, yeah. They're underneath and they don't get any natural light at all. And my outdoor trees, I protect, I have a little alcove that they're tucked away in. Uh, some are on shelves and they're protected mainly from the wind. The wind is the most damaging to trees outdoors. So you wanna make sure that they stay uh, watered. So the biggest mistake people make is they don't make, they don't keep them moisturize during the winter you know of course when it's cold they're frozen they're not going to absorb any water but when they thaw out you want to make sure they're moist because the trees will dry up really quickly if you don't water them and they start growing in the spring when it gets warmer and and the air and the water I mean the wind will actually dry these out really fast and that's so that's what kills a tree and when you start getting into the you know, yo-yo up and down weather that we have here in yeah, Cincinnati. I know. <laughs> Once the trees start sprouting and the roots are doing the same thing, they're growing again, you might want to bring those to a protected, you know, unheated garage or something so they won't freeze. Because that's a, the biggest reason people lose trees is by that reason that in the springtime, you know, you have new growth, you have new roots growing and all of a sudden, bam, it gets down to 10 degrees again and you have a hard freeze and there goes your favorite tree and it's always your favorite tree that dies yeah I feel like that's with my plants too I know so, <laughs> I do try know, hard though yeah with house plants you know you 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 take when you repot a house plant you take them out of the pot and put them in a bigger pot so with bonsai you don't do that you take them oh, right. out of the pot you trim the roots and put them back in the stain the pot. Same pot. So yeah. the combination of trimming the, trimming the roots and trimming the foliage, that's what keeps them small. So you can grow bonsai in the ground for several years and keep them styled and try to maintain. Um, you, there's techniques by putting them on top of a rock to keep the roots spread rather than going a big tap oh. root straight down. So yeah. by growing them in the ground for a few years, you'll get a lot larger 
trunk growth versus a same tree for the same amount of years in a pot. It takes a lot longer to get some a sizable trunk in a pot than it does a tree in the ground. So then once you grow in the ground for a few years, you can put it in the pot. Oh, and it would have a substantially larger trunk. Right. Um, yeah, we have one more question. Um, what have you learned about Japanese culture in general as a result of studying bonsai? Well, my, my take is it, it is like just just peace and harmony with nature and 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 people. Mm -hmm. I think is my biggest takeaway. Um, it, 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 it is so peaceful to you know to you know be in perhaps a Japanese garden and 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 see and hear the waterfall and the, and the different types of rock formations and the, the pathways you know, that you might walk through and, and, and see the bonsai. And it's, to me, to me, it's just so, so serene and peaceful. And, and, and it just, you're just one with nature where you just, just so relaxing. Yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> Especially when, you know, with the trees and the rocks together. Uh, I didn't even know that you could do that in bonsai, actually. I saw in the presentation. So it's, I really like rock um, gardens a lot because it's rocks and it's not live plants. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was really exciting for me to know that you could do a bonsai tree within a sort of rock garden type thing. And that's really interesting. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Uh, do you have any um, other questions? Um, personally, I'm first time for me to be exposed with this details to this depth about bonsai. And then there's some uh, similarity in Ike, with Ikebana, which I do, but this bonsai is just nurturing and growing the living uh, tree for years and then maybe more than just years, 10, 10 years and longer than that. And just fascinating uh, the concept of this uh, uh, bonsai art is, mm -hmm similar but so different from uh, cut flowers and cut branches and then display and to take pictures and that was it <laughs> rather than just you know growing taking the time and, yeah a yeah, long time so it's fascinating um any questions well uh yeah please um you have any questions Please do not hesitate. He covers, Evanson covers a lot where to go to get uh, bonsai starter kits and everything. Uh, I would like to go to Lowe's and then just look around. I've never I know. paid attention, uh, which I regret. You know, I, I didn't know, even know it's, it was so close to us. So yeah, there's a really good nursery in Florence, Kentucky called Reminiscent okay. Nursery. Oh, okay. I, I live in near Florence, so I'll check that yeah, out. Yeah, they're, they're probably the best supplier that, that's close. There's a, another BC nursery in Batavia. Mm. That's a good supplier. And, and, uh, and other than that, I think you have to really go to Indianapolis. Yeah, to get some good ones. Okay, what? Well, uh, may, I, may I put in a plug? We'll have a bonsai show at the Perm Conservatory in September. Ooh, yeah. yes, put in a plug, plug it yes. up. Bonsai, bonsai events at the yes, conservatory. So keep a lookout for that in, in the Crown Conservatory. So uh, there's a question as a yeah. <laughs> beginner, what kind of tools should we buy to just start? Um, I would buy, so I wouldn't spend a lot of money on tools till mm -hmm. you know you're going to really seriously stay with a hobby. Mm -hmm. So some you know, little little kit that would have maybe a concave cutter, a pair of scissors and wire cutters and, um, you know, perhaps a knob cutter, something like that. Mm. Now you can go get, you know, these real um, expensive stainless steel tools, but, and, you know, I wouldn't spend a ton of money until you're sure you're going to actually stay with the hobby. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. 
Is there any uh, characteristics for the people who uh, fit to this hobby? <laughs> I mean, do that's you That's a good question. <laughs> I well, like that's a good I, question. <laughs> I think that the people that I've met have always been so, so nice and generally helpful and mm -hmm. just so eager to share, you know, their knowledge about it. Um, does the bonsai just, system, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just want to say it's just, it's everybody that I've met has always been such, you know, good, 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 friendly people. Yeah. Are they all patient? Yeah, <laughs> not everybody, not yeah. everybody. <laughs> Some people want instant bonsai. It's so hard to do. Like when we have our beginners class probably coming up in April, and I could share that with the Japan American Society when well, I don't know that we have nailed down the date yet, but you know, some people in the beginners class, I want an instant bonsai. But uh, yeah, so that's our two big events of the year is the beginners class, which we have at the, at the Civic Garden Center. And then we have the bonsai show usually around uh, end of September, October sometime. Will that information be on, on the website, I'm assuming? Yeah, so uh, Bonsai yeah. Society has a website that it will be there. If we have a Facebook page as well, and we, we could uh, definitely share it with the uh, society. Of course, you know. you definitely. <laughs> Uh, we got, um, this is, this was amazing. Thank you so much to the presenter. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, Honored to be you. asked. Yeah, um, really appreciate um, your knowledge and experience and everything. Uh, and you, you are so close to us. And then we look forward to another opportunity to work with you. Um, yeah, maybe a live, we can do a live one eventually. Yeah. Right. That would be really fun, I think. Yeah, come to one of our meetings and just watch. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to be a member to come and visit. But yeah, Tariqa was right. You know, I think that's another thing that was interesting about being in bonsai. You learned some of the other arts. You know, you know, like like uh, ikebana or kusamono or uh, suiseki. You know, that's that's the other thing. It just it widens your uh, appreciation of other types of uh, art like that. Right. Cool. Well, Thank you so much. It's seven uh, oh two and perfect timing. And we hope we answer uh, to all the questions. And then thanks so much again, uh, Mr. Luis. Luis, uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation and educational, very informative. We appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, people, for joining <laughs> us today. See you next time. All Bye. right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.